tonight, our speaker is uh, Professor Timothy Fortin. He is the Assistant Professor and Chair of Philosophical Theology at Seton Hall University. Um, he earned an MA in Philosophy from the Catholic University of America and an MS in Clinical Psychology from the Institute for the Psychological Sciences in Arlington, Virginia. He received his PhD in Philosophy from the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross in Rome. His doctoral dissertation is titled Fatherhood and Perfection of Masculine Identity, a Thomistic Account in Light of Contemporary Science. Dr. Fortin's areas of specialization include the philosophy of psychology and the philosophy of fatherhood. Among his classes are History of Philosophy I, Philosophy of Being, and the Philosophy of Nature. So he is exactly the right man to take us through uh, tonight's topic. And so without further ado, um, Dr. Fortin. Thank you very much, Dr. Stewart. First, I really would like to thank Dr. Stewart and Dr. Orlandi for bringing me here. It's a great honor to be speaking here. I was hoping to be there in person and my apologies for not being there in person. Unfortunately, the travel restrictions that New Jersey imposes got the better of me. So I wasn't able to come there. A few preliminary remarks. Obviously, as Dr. Stewart alluded to, this is, it's a sensitive topic. As I was preparing, I had that really strange feeling when you realize that you've bitten off more than you can chew. Um, just in the sense that this is, this is something that I would typically do in a semester long class. So I'm gonna try to do a semester long class in approximately 45 minutes to an hour. So in that way, I really have to ask your your patience and kind of your forgiveness up front in that we're going to move quickly and it's going to be impossible for me to treat the topics that i want to treat and anywhere near the way that i'd like to treat them however as dr stewart noted noted the, it's my understanding of the whole point of this is to talk about the divides and the only way that we can talk about the divides is to look at all of the positions and to look at all the positions means that we're not gonna be able to give ample attention to each one. So I'm gonna to have to give a kind of, you know, 30,000 aerial view, 30,000 foot aerial view of each position. So as Dr. Stewart noted, I was gonna say, get out a, a pad of paper and write down your questions as we go, because I, I wanna leave room for questions so that we can get to the things that are important to you. So, but since now you don't have to, you can just write them in the chat. So please do that so that we can come back to the things that are important to you. Okay, uh, just, just a kind of technical note. I'm, I'm, just, I'm actually gonna read my introduction and, and then in the interest of time, I'm gonna shift to just uh, kind of working from notes there from. So you'll, you'll notice a kind of shift. So, so let us begin. And we'll begin with a poem that's too famous, but I couldn't resist from T.S. Eliot. The eagle soars in the summit of heaven. The hunter with his dogs pursues his circuit. O perpetual revolution of configured stars. O perpetual recurrence of determined seasons. O world of spring and autumn, birth and dying. The endless cycle of idea and action, endless invention, endless experiment brings knowledge of motion, but not of stillness. Knowledge of speech, but not of silence. Knowledge of words and ignorance of the word. All our knowledge brings us nearer to our ignorance. All our ignorance brings us nearer to death, but nearness to death no nearer to God. Where is the life we have lost in living? Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? The cycle of heaven in 20 centuries brings us farther from God and nearer to the dust. I would like to speak to you this evening of God. And, I'd like, and I would like to speak to you of dust, for I'd like to speak to you of sexual difference, which marks a way in which the dust we are is formed to persons of flesh 
and spirit, matter and soul, a soul which escapes the limits of that matter and so stretches towards eternity, bringing with it in its train, like a comet's tail, the very sexual difference that it transcends. But forgive me, I move too swiftly, for I begin at the end and so must end my beginning by saying that I would like to tell you a story, a story that I hope all will enjoy, for it is, or at least should be, a romance, a comedy, though not without adventure and not without tragedy. Though there is perhaps wisdom that has been lost in knowledge, knowledge lost in information, and even perhaps life lost in living. The story I will tell is about that which it seems most stories are about. It is a story about sex. I should it should thus be a love story, but it is not always so. We must try to learn why. It will have four chapters. The first chapter, the story that science tells of sexual difference. What is it? How does it happen? When does it happen? Where does it happen? This is primarily not about speaking, but about simply listening, looking and listening to what sexual difference is as we experience it. The following three chapters are stories about the first story. For the evolutionist will tell us a story of genes, genes that simply do what they do, seek to replicate themselves. Yet this activity of the gene leads to sexual difference as we know it. Our next chapter is divided into two parts. It is the feminist story. First, it is a story of freedom, of a liberated subject casting off the bonds of oppression and alienation. It is Simone de Beauvoir's account of woman as the second sex. Next is the story told by Judith Butler in which the subject itself seems to dissolve in discourse and biological sex itself is seen as a mere performance of reiterate, reiterated acts compelled by law, by a power that functions as the very soul of the sexed body. We'll end our account with the love story, with the rendering of sexual difference according to the thought of two saints, Thomas Aquinas and John Paul II. And then finally, we'll try to see if somehow the three stories could ever possibly be merged into one. Chapter one, a scientist story or an organ recital. So now we start with what does science give us about sexual difference? What can we know about sexual difference? As I said in the, in the, in the, the short introduction, simply by observing. And as I know that this is the point of silence. This is where we simply want to close our mouths and open our eyes and look at what the phenomena of sexual difference is. As I think about this to myself, I, I always think of actually of Ptolemy and of the ancient philosophers trying to understand the movement of the stars. Before you can understand the movement of the stars, the first thing you have to do is lie on your back at night, not talk and just keep your eyes open and look and look and look and look. Then you can begin to try to give an account of what you've seen. So our first step here is to simply look at what sexual difference is. And I'd like to start with Cambridge psychologist, Simon Baron Cohen. He gives five levels of sexual difference or five levels of, at which sexual difference exists. And we'll have to try to figure out how to, how to make sense of all of these together. The first level of difference that he gives is genetic. And we all know that XX versus XY. The next level of difference he gives is gonadal. There's a distinction in gonads, ovaries versus tex testicles. The next level he gives is genital. There's a distinction in genital organs, penis, scrotum versus vagina, clitoris. The next difference he gives becomes a little more murky. It's a neurological difference. He claims, and many scientists claims that there are differences in the brain. 
Finally, he looks at behavioral differences. And this is where, what the social sciences will give us. Those are his five levels. And I'd like to briefly review them. However, before doing that, to me, it's worth noting two other levels that are going to come into this discussion, especially when we get to feminist thought. And that is what I call psychological differentiation or the difference of your self-knowledge of yourself as sexed. We as human beings can look at ourselves and reflect upon ourselves. And thus we know ourselves as sexed, as being one sex or another. And so self-identity is perhaps another level of sexual differentiation. How does one understand oneself? And then the final level could be called social role or identity. There are social expectations and social roles that seem to go along with each different sex. Sometimes this is described as gender. So that's another level of sexual differentiation. Again, that we're gonna have to discern and figure out, okay, how do we fit all of these things together? Now, let's start off as simply as possible, just with genetic sex. All of us right now, amazingly, are engaged in a process uh, our, our reproductive systems are engaged in a process called meiosis. As, as you all know, your DNA exists in two strands, one strand that you receive from your mother, one strand that you receive from your father. What your reproductive system is doing right now is taking those two strands of DNA and un, uncombining them unbinding them into single strands. And those single strands will become the nuclei of your, reproductive, of your reproductive cells, of your gametes. So in women, that will be the, that untwined single strand of DNA will become the center, the nucleus of an ovary. In men, those, un, those unwound strands of DNA become the nuclei of spermatozoa. Now, interestingly, if you think about this, women are XX. They receive an X from their mother and an X from their father. So when their DNA unstrands, each reproductive cell will necessarily be carrying an X chromosome. But think about what happens when the male's DNA is unwound. One strand will have an X, one strand will have a Y. One, therefore, one sperm, will carry an X chromosome and one sperm will carry a Y chromosome. And now we have the great mystery that baffled Aristotle of how in human sexual differentiation happens. It happens because 50% of, of a male's sperm carries X chromosome and 50% carry Y chromosome. And so now we move forward to the process of conception. All of the sperm are trying to make their way to the ovum. Only one, generally, there are rare occasions where two make it, but almost always only one will make it to the nuclei of the ovum. And that will necessarily either be one carrying an X or one carrying a Y. And there we have the first determination of the brand new human being as either male or female, depending on which sperm makes its way to the ovum. There is the first instance of sex in a new human being. The individual is either XX or XY, and thus determined to either be a male or a female. Now, there's lots of issues dealing with the Aristotelian notions of actuality and potentiality that we have to discuss here, but there's not time. So, for the first six weeks of gestation, embryologists say you can't tell the difference between an XX and an XY embryo. Looking under the microscope, their, their development is indistinguishable. However, at around week six of gestation, the first momentous action of the Y chromosome happens. The Y chromosome releases an enzyme that will, that will prompt a, a structure. You can call it a protostructure. They'll call it the protogonads. There's a structure that's forming that is in a certain sense pluripotent, pluripotent to become either ovaries or testicles. Now, I have to qualify that as well. If an individual is XY, 
it's only very, very rarely that that ovaries could form, almost non-existent. How, so, but that same structure that becomes testicles in males becomes ovaries in females. So the Y chromosome cues that structure to, be, to form as testicles. So now we have the gonadal distinction of sex that Baron Cohen talked about. Next, those new little testicles start producing hormones, androgens. And it's those androgens that will take over the process of sexual differentiation. So the first thing that they'll start doing is something similar has happened with the gonads. Those hormones will tell similar structures or structures that, that again, are kind of pluripotent. In males, the same, the, 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 the same structure that will become a clitoris in females will form into the penis in males under the influence of androgens. Similarly, the same structure that, we, that will become the labia in female become the scrotum in males. The internal genitalia, there's a slightly different process. Again, in the interest of time, I'll skip over that. But now we have the genital distinction under the influence of hormones from the testicles. So now we've got genetic, we've got gonadal, we've got genital. Interestingly, what they've noticed is that your brain also has hormone receptors. And so your brain is also sensitive to those hormones that the male testicles are, are, are pumping out. And so just like with the genitals, in the absence of hormones, female genitals form. Now those hormones start to work on the brain. This is an area of a ton of controversy, like everything in this field. However, the research seems to be mounting that there are real distinctions in the male and female brain. Again, it would take the rest of our time here to go through all of them. The research is clear in things like mice and monkeys, where you can do uh, experiments that obviously that you can't do on humans. So we have to try to figure out post facto what the differences are. But just some examples would be, um, it's, they found that the corpus callosum, the part that, that, that joins the two hemispheres of your brain are more dense in the anterior fifth of the female, of the female corpus callosum. They've also noticed different organizational patterns in male and female brains. Female brains tend to be more bilateral. There tends to be more interconnection of the parts of the brain. Males' brains tend to be more localized. Males' brains tend to do things in one place. And those places, they have their little compartments and that where it's, that's where it happens. These, those are just a few examples. There's distinction in size, there's distinction in both gray matter and white matter. Now, it should be said that, that in this realm, unlike the genetic distinction, these will be things, however, that exist in overlapping, overlapping distributions. In other words, some males are gonna have more densely packed corpus callosi than, than females. But on average, the female corpus callosum, for instance, will be more densely packed, perhaps leading to greater interconnectivity of the brain. So there's Baron Cohen's fourth level. The fifth level is behavioral. This is the realm of social science. Again, this would be a, a multi-hour discussion as well. But just a few small examples, males tend towards, have a greater tendency towards physical aggression, for example. Males tend to have a greater proclivity for casual sexual encounter, for example. You can go into you know, what modern personality theorists talk about as the big five personality types and you'll find differences in the personality types. Women tend to be higher in agreeableness. They tend to be higher in negative emotion, for instance. Males tend to be higher in certain aspects of assertiveness. Um, these are experimental, experimental findings from social science. Now, I should add that social psychology will sometimes find that these findings are, are subject to social pressure. Fascinating experiments where you see, for instance, if a person before doing a math aptitude exam is asked to indicate their sex, girls will sco score lower on those tests than if they're not 
asked to indicate their sex, with the idea being, if you make a girl think about her sex prior to taking a math test, and she thinks she's not good at math because she's a girl, she'll tend to do poorer. So these, these social differences have to be examined. But again, in the interest of time, I'm actually going to leave it there. And I think I'm going to leave it, I'm going to leave it there for the science, for that which we observe. So these are the observed facts, like the movement of the stars that have to be explained. These are simply the facts that have to be explained. Now, it might be that what we'll want to do is simply explain them away. But in any case, we have to explain them because this is what we experience and what we find about sexual difference. So now we move on to chapter two, which is our first attempt at explaining these phenomena. And this is the evolutionary account, which I call the story of the gene. I've got to make some preliminary, um, preliminary comments here. So I'm going to be giving the position of some evolutionist, which I think is not necessarily the full story of evolution. In other words, I, uh, as I'll discuss later, I think you can hold to evolution and not hold the positions that, that I'm speaking of. For instance, if any of you were, were at um, Dr. Kuhn, Professor Kuhn's talk last night, you heard him speak about the compatibility, for instance, of evolution with a Christian worldview, with a religious worldview. But I'm going to be giving you the position of what tend to be atheistic evolutionists, people, some of whom I, I respect very much, somebody like Steven Pinker, who's one of the main sources for his idea of evolution. The other thing, that, that I think I should say, is that I'm kind of taking things a little bit out of order. I'm gonna end with the Thomistic position. So we're picking up here in the Enlightenment. We're picking up after Descartes. And so we're picking up with what is a scientific view of the world. You know, Descartes basically divides the world into two. We have thinking things, and then we have the world of extension. And regarding the world of extension, we will only hold of the world of extension what we can know clearly and distinctly, which ends up being what we can know mathematical, mathematically. And so this is a view, this is a essentially a view of sexual difference that is a scientific view. It's starting off in the world of extended matter and what we can know clearly and distinctly about that extended matter. And within evolution, the, the linchpin is going to be the gene because, and this is Steven Pinker following, um, following Richard Dawkins, the gene is the, smallest replicating, is the smallest replicating unit. It's that which replicates itself. And so evolution is simply concerned, according to Pinker following Dawkins, about what projects genes into the future. And so the story of, of sexual difference is simply going to be a story of what was adaptive. We're going to talk, we're going to start from the simplest of living forms, the simplest of things that can replicate themselves and ask ourselves, how do we go from this simple replicating being by a process of random mutation, small, small changes, and natural selection? Those small changes being selected over time and over time, simply for that which survives most effectively in a given environment. So we start from there and, and with those small changes over time, we end up, we, where we begin with the smallest living things and we end up with human males and human females. That's the story we have to tell. How do we get there? How in the world do we end up from some sort of amoeba floating in a pond somewhere to Adam and Eve, to male, human male and human female. Now, once again, obviously, if we did anything close to telling that story, um, we'll be here forever. So all I can try to do is to give you a sense of how the explanation, how their expl explanatory paradigm works. So, I've already mentioned the basic, the basic mechanisms, which are 
random mutation and natural selection. And so the first thing we have to figure out is how in the world do we get to sexual reproduction? Some general points. It's thought that sexual reproduction has, has evolved multiple times. In other words, there's not simply one chain of sexual, uh, of sexual difference occurring, and then all subsequent sub sexual difference happens from that one chain. Sexual difference, they think, evolved multiple times. The first, I believe, is thought to be about 2 billion years ago. So sexual difference, according to the evolutionists, is about 2 billion years old, which later on is going to be something, a, a fact that's going to be interesting for, for the social constructionists to have to explain how something 2 billion years is socially constructed. But we'll come to that later. Now, the first big question is how and how and why in the world do we go from asexual reproduction to sexual reproduction? In evolutionary terms, this should make no sense at all. Think about what evolution is. You have a genotype that allowed you to exist, allowed you to survive to the point of reproducing. What does evolution say? Well, what you wanna do is you wanna reproduce that very genotype because it's that very genotype that led you to survive. If it's a genotype that is a slightly longer beak, you wanna produce another slightly longer beak to get that seed, for instance. So you want to reproduce your genotype. That means that asexual reproduction should absolutely be the gold standard in any reproduction because asexual reproduction produces an exact genetic replica of yourself. So why in the world would you switch from asexual reproduction to some mode of sexual reproduction where now you have the genetic contribution of two members of a species? So you have genetic variation. It makes no sense. Again, I mean, that's the first puzzle that the evolutionists have to solve. And once again, for us to go into detail there would take way too long. Let me just say this much. What they hold and what experimental evidence seems to verify is that when you arrive in environments that are highly variable and you have relatively complex organisms, it becomes adaptive for those organisms to provide more genetic variation with the idea of greater possibility for adaptation to that environment. So the classic example that they give is pathogens. You have pathogens that are trying to attack you as we know all know well now from COVID. Now, if you're a more advanced organism, you're gonna reproduce, reproduce on a much slower cycle than these simple organisms that are trying to attack you. If they break the code of your immune system and you produce an offspring who has an immune system exactly the same as you are, then de facto, they've broken the code of your, of your offspring's immune system. But if you add in genetic variation, then you change the locks, you change the code. A pathogen breaking breaking down your immune system does not necessarily mean that it's broken down your offspring's immune system. So, so sexual, uh, so our reproduction with genetic contribution of two parents becomes adaptive. I just have to add a parenthetical note because I can't resist. Um, experiments show that women are attracted to the smell of men who have reproductive, or, or excuse me, um, uh, immune systems that are compatible with theirs, that, that make for a, um, a the offspring with immune systems that are, more, that are more robust. However, this is fascinating too. If a woman goes on birth control, if she goes on the pill, she will actually prefer the smell of men with immune systems more like hers. And so we'll be attracted to men who are more like her family. Um, anyhow, 
just an interesting fact related to this theory about the evolution of sexual different of why sexual difference evolved in the first place. Okay, now we have some evolutionary reason for why this power of generation divided into two. But you have to note, and this blew me away when I first thought of it, or when I first read it, there is no a priori reason why these two mating types should be different. We need, a, we need a genetic contribution of two, but there's no reason why the two should be different. And once again, evolution would say, it makes no sense for them to be different. If there's only one mate, think about it. If there's only one mating type, then finding a mate is all the more easy. It's far easier because you can, you can mate with any other member of the species. As soon as you have two mating types, finding a mate becomes infinitely harder, not infinitely, but way harder because your potential mates are immediately limited by half. Now your potential mates are reduced to half the species. Why? Why do it then? Once again, it seems to make no sense. Why not just have one mate, mating type? Again, for us to talk about exactly the evolution of that would take far too long. But we would have to look at, um, but this is so fascinating as well. It's a process that they call disruptive evolution, where instead of one factor being selected, you have two extremes being selected. So you have, you have the, the evolution, not of sexual reproduction, just of reproduction by two parents. Each are contributing, say, an equal cell, an equal gamete. Well, it turns out, that the more effective, that the offspring that are, that are surviving more effectively are those where one is produ producing a richer cell and the other is producing a simpler cell. And then over time, both extremes start getting selected. And so on one side, the richer cell starts getting richer and richer. On the other side, the simpler cell starts getting simpler and simpler until we reach two extremes where you can't go any further, where you have one member of the species producing a rich cell, the cell that has everything that is needed for the, for the new offspring to grow, except for one thing, except for one strand of DNA from the other person. And the other member preside, prevents that, that one other thing, which is that one single strand of DNA. So you may have just realized that we have, we have now biologically arrived at the definition of male and female. We now have sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction is where one member of the species provides this rich gamete that we call the ovum or the, or the egg that has all everything needed for the new offspring to grow except for that one contribution from the other parent, the single strand of DNA. That's what the male provides. So the female is that member of the species that produces, that reproduces, that has the power of generation, that has the power of reproduction in virtue of producing ova. The male is that member of the species that has the power of generation in virtue of producing spermatozoa. That is true across all species. And once again, and it evolved in that way in distinct chains. This was a solution that was always arrived at. Utterly fascinating, utterly fascinating. Okay, for what it's worth, the speculation is that one of the reasons why this disruptive evolution happened was because of mitochondrial DNA. Um, the DNA in, my, if you have two DNA each having, or excuse me, two cells each having mitochondria, they're, they're that the, mito, the mitochondrial DNA are gonna war against each other and they're gonna beat the hell out of each other and make a more, um, uh, and make a less, um, a more beat up cell using technical terminology. Um, okay. So, bam, we have, our, we have our first instance of sexual difference. But how in the world do we go from that to the human male and the human female? That's what we have to figure out now. Once again, of course we can't, we can't even come close to, to tracing that history. 
But so all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you some, some basic principles. And here's the most fundamental principle. The sex with the greater investment in reproduction ends up limiting and choosing, limiting reproduction and choosing with whom she will reproduce. The sex with less investment in reproduction competes and has to compete for access to the one with greater investment in reproduction. So like it or not, we start with an asymmetry. The female by definition has greater investment in reproduction. Why? Because she's producing this much richer, more valuable cell. And so she is going to evolve to accommodate that cell. And so you're gonna have internal organs, for instance, to protect what's more valuable. In the male, there'll be a movement towards external organs. Why? Because the male produces gazillions of cells. And so he's actually gonna have a different reproductive strategy as well, which is trying to produce multiple times as opposed to producing fewer times and preserving that which, you, that which your offspring, your, your single offspring. And so over time, you have a movement towards, again, more internal organs in the female, external organs in the male. Now, as I noted, males are also gonna have to compete with each other for access to females. And, the, and that's all over the evolutionary history. That means males are going to get, they're gonna have a distinct evolutionary pressure because they have to compete with each other. And the stronger that competition, the greater difference is going to be. And the stronger that competition is gonna be is based on how females dis distribute themselves and, how the, and, and the fertility of how many females a male can control. So an extreme is an elephant seal. One male elephant can seal can control a beach of, of multiple, uh, I, I think it's over 20 female elephant seals. If one elef male elephant can seal can control the fertility of say 20 female elephant seals, that means there's gonna be 19 male elephant seals with no mating opportunity. So how do you think the competition is gonna be for access to that beach? It's gonna be pretty fierce. And so male elephant seals are four times larger than female elephant seals and sometimes seven times as heavy. Why? Because they had to fight each other. Male elephant seals had to fight each other for access to the females. That was a pressure that was not on the females. And so you have this distinctive evolutionary pressure that produces distinct phenotypes in the males and females. Now, interestingly, it does happen occasionally that there are some species of bird and fish where the female Act, or excuse me, where the male actually has more investment in reproduction than the female does. The female lays the eggs. This is obviously where there is external gestation. The female lays the eggs and then the male guards them and stays with the eggs while the female is out gallivanting. In those species, the females have what would typically be considered male characteristics. The females are larger, faster, stronger, and more aggressive. Why? Because they have to fight other females for the mating opportunities, which is pretty interesting confirmation of the theory. Now, through this process, over eons, the evolutionists will say, we end up with human males and females with the phenotypic and behavioral characteristics that we have. So I, I, I noted, I mentioned a couple behavioral characteristics. Males are more physically aggressive, sociologically. How would the evolutionists explain that? How, the, how do they explain the phenomena? How do they explain any of these phenomena? It's pretty incredible. The evolutionists can give you explanations for all of those levels that, that Baron Cohen listed, according to their processes. So, um, you know, how did the, how did the gonads uh, evolve? How did the genitals evolve? How did the secondary sex characteristics evolve? Why, are, why do males have broader shoulders and more upper body strength? 
why are they more physically aggressive? Well, they'll say, obviously, because they had to fight each other. And again, the evolutionary, the genetic evidence bears that out. You apparently have twice as many female ancestors as you have male ancestors. Why is that? Well, because a lot of males did not reproduce. Why? Because if you have Genghis Khan, who is, who apparently, you know, is somehow related to an incredible large swath of, of Asia, that's a lot of men that didn't reproduce and a lot of women who did. So that's who the evolution will say. Why are males 15% larger than females? Because they had to fight each other. So that's just an example. So this, so that is by example, how the evolutionists will explain the phenomena that I laid out in chapter one. So I'm gonna to have to let that be the end of chapter two, chapter three, which is feminist thought. Okay, chapter three is in two parts and I'm gonna to have to try to move quickly. Um, the two parts are one devoted to Simone de Beauvoir, the other devoted to Judith Butler. So let's start with Simone de Beauvoir. Um, some of you probably know Simone de Beauvoir. She was the lover of Jean-Paul Sartre. And so um, a, a kind of adherent of, of his existentialist philosophy, but a, um, a profound thinker in her own right and a subtle thinker in her own right. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of speaking about the evolutionists, the Cartesian split and how, how the evolutionary theory kind of lands itself really on the sides of, of res extesa, the extended matter and looking at how does matter act under these forces of nature. Simone de Beauvoir is going to grant that. Simone, as a matter of fact, in the beginning of the second sex, she has a long section devoted to speaking about the evolution of sexual difference. But for her, that's a matter of what she is going to simply call facticity. It's a matter of brute fact. And following Jean-Paul Sartre, you know, Sartre's famous dictum is that existence precedes essence. Things are simply given without essence. Everything is given without meaning. There is no intrinsic meaning to anything. Therefore, if we talk about something that is simply a matter of a brute given fact, in some sense, who cares? It's like a stone in your path. It's an obstacle that you have to overcome, but no more. One can divine no meaning or purpose out of what's simply given. So whence, whence cometh meaning or purpose? It comes from the other side of the Cartesian split because you are not simply extended matter. As a matter of fact, your body is something relatively extrinsic to you. Here we end up, here we, we begin with Descartes' cogito, which Beauvoir expressly begins with. And Parenthetically, Judith Butler will expressly deny. You begin with yourself as a thinking thing. You are and you are a thinking thing. And what Butler, excuse me, what Beauvoir focuses on is the fact not only you are a thinking thing, but you are a freedom. You are essentially a freedom. And your role in this world is essentially to express your freedom in projects in actual physical, physical projects, which you embody and make happen in the world. Interestingly, in her Ethics of Ambiguity, Beauvoir, however, uh, I think in a slight departure from Sartre, you know, who famously sees, you know, who says that hell is other people. Why? Because, because we're, we are all individual freedoms fighting against each other, each trying to define our own worlds according to our freedom. Well, Beauvoir realizes that in order for me to make, to, to realize my freedom in the world, I somehow have to, excuse me, I somehow have to respect the freedoms of others and find a way to make our freedoms work together. So this is the goal. 
It's in a way the maxima maximization of freedom. Now, but what's the story of humanity? For her, the story is, it is one that begins with the facticity of sex. And based upon that facticity of sex, we end up with one sex being oppressed by the other and systematically oppressed by the other. And so Beauvoir perhaps most famously said that women are not born or you're not born a woman, you become a woman. So what in the world does that mean? You're born with the facticity of biological sex. But once again, that's just a brute fact that's bereft of meaning. Any meaning that will be given to that sex. So, so sex is in the realm of facticity. It's in the realm of, of, of Car Descartes' extended matter. What will give meaning to that are freedoms. Freedoms will give meaning. That brings us into the realm of the res cogitans, of the thinking thing. And that's what she cares about. She doesn't really care about the facticity of, of biological sex. One is made a woman in the realm of freedom, in the realm of being a thinking thing. And here we have the heart of the, of the distinction between sex and gender. Sex is a matter of facticity. Gender is a matter of how one's freedom is defined according to that facticity. It's the meaning given to the fact of gender. And for her, that meaning has been an oppressive meaning. That's why the title of her book is The Second Sex. Woman has always been made to be the second sex. What does she mean by that? Again, in our Sartrean paradigm of freedoms who are able to define reality, woman is always the one who is being defined by the man. She is always in the role of the one who has to accept a definition. Man is the one who defines. Man is the one who gets to determine. Man is the one who goes out into the world and is able to express his freedom by, by engaging in projects in the world. Woman ends up stuck in the house. And she says, uh, she notes two fundamental movements of imminence and basically imminence and transcendence. Woman is tied to her facticity. She becomes a breeder. This is why Beauvoir has a relatively intense antipathy for motherhood because it's motherhood that ends up binding woman to her facticity, to her, to her matter. And so unlike the male who's able to go out and express his freedom in the world by making projects that express his freedom, the woman is locked in home with the children simply making new flesh. Now, Beauvoir gives an entire genealogy. Much of the, 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 the second sex is a genealogy of how this came about. It starts with the fact, with just with the facticity of woman's role in reproduction. But according to Beauvoir, that means nothing. We give it the meaning. The most momentous part of that, she claims, comes with the advent of private property, because with private property, now males have property that they can be bequeathed to their offspring. And therefore, since they can bequeath their property, they need to own their offspring. And if they're gonna own their offspring, they need to own the means to their offspring, which are women. And so women become part of their property. And she'll hold, how, so how do, male, how do males pull off this oppression? Well, you can pull it off by brute force, or you can pull it off by a process of what she calls mystification. You can convince the woman that this is her natural place, that this is her nature. By nature, she's simply a mother. By nature, she's simply in the house. 
but we've already established there is no nature. There's no intrinsic meaning to your facticity. This is a ploy, according to Beauvoir. It's a ploy of men to oppress women and to, and to make them fat, dumb, and happy in their oppression. Oh, I'm fulfilling my nature. Well, according to Beauvoir, your nature is a ruse. It's a trick. And so the purpose of her book, The Second Sex, is to demystify you, to demystify everybody, to pull the, you know, to, to pull the curtain back on Oz so that, so that women will know that they need not be defined by their facticity. They are freedoms and they can define themselves and they must define themselves. And if men are going to truly be freedoms, they will allow women to define themselves and to be freedoms and to make their own projects in the world. So this is, the, I, th I think, really the heart of second wave feminism and the distinction between, between sex and gender. The facticity of sex remains the same. What must be changed is the meaning of woman from this second sex, the, the social role of the second sex to a new social role, a new meaning, which again is in the realm of the res cogitans, of the thinking thing. Sex is in the realm of facticity, of extended things. Okay, that's gonna have to suffice for Beauvoir. Next, Judith Butler. Where do we go with Judith Butler? Um, okay, especially in like five to 10 minutes. I've titled this, this, this section, Inversions and Requiem for the Self. Butler is going to, Butler respects Beauvoir, obviously, but she thinks Beauvoir has not gone far enough. Beauvoir, according to Butler, has made, a, has made a critical mistake in accepting the facticity of sex and of saying that somehow gender is a cultural interpretation of sex. That, according to Butler, gives sex a pre-discursive existence Somehow sex exists independent of our, of our social construction, really. And for Butler, there is nothing that escapes essentially the formative power of what she'll call the heteronormative matrix or social powers, social laws. Social laws construct everything, including, including the biological self, and ultimately including the very substance and the very notion of identity itself. Everything is constructed. Your very identity is illusory. And in fact, it's a neurotic response to a, to a inherent fear of the fractured nature of what you call yourself. In this, she's following Jacques Lacan, though she'll depart from Lacan as well, because Lacan also holds too much as pre-discursive. So, very quickly, there are two fundamental inversions that, that, that Butler um, effects. First, the first one I already mentioned, Beauvoir will hold that somehow gender is constructed upon sex. Butler says it's the other way around. Sex, biological sex itself in your body rather is a result of gender. Gender brings your, your sexed body into being. So, and we'll have to say a little bit about how that is. 
Now, the other inversion is related to it. In a few minutes, I'm gonna talk incredibly briefly about the Thomistic position. And in the Thomistic position, we're going to begin with substance. We're gonna begin with something that exists in itself, a substance, a subject. And within that subject exists a sex. So sex is a quality of my subject. And because I have the sex that I have, certain desires flow from myself as sexed. And I think what Butler would have in mind here is, as a male, I desire females. And from my desire flows a sexuality. As a male, I desire females. Therefore, I, I am possessed of heterosexuality. And then finally, from my sexuality flows my behaviors. And so I will engage in heterosexual behaviors. That's what Butler says is the standard order, the standard metaphysical order of substance, the metaphysics of substance that Western philosophy has held to for centuries. Butler says that order has to be inverted. It is exactly backwards. We are mistaking effect for cause. She says rather, you begin with behaviors. You begin with behaviors and precisely behaviors that are, that are enforced upon you by a law, by a cultural law. A cultural law enforces behaviors upon you and you reiterate those behaviors. You cite those behaviors like a writer citing a text. You cite the law in your behavior and you engage in behaviors according to the law. This is our notion of performativity. Performativity, I can't say it right now because I'm trying to go too fast. Performativity. So you perform reiterated actions according to the law over and over again, under the force of punishment, out of fear. That causes your desires to be as they are. Excuse me, that, that institutes your sexuality and it institutes your sexuality as heterosexuality because you exist in a heteronormative matrix. The power that is, that is forming you is a heteronormative power. It is making you by forced behavior into, into having heterosexuality. That heterosexuality then determines your desire. And that very desire determines your body as sexed. And she will hold over and over. And it is through your sex, it is only through being sexed that you come into existence as a substance, as, an, as a very individual existing. Now, obviously we're in a very different world and to understand this world, we'd have to talk first about Nietzsche, then, and primarily I think about Heidegger and what Heidegger thinks about the existence of world and your existence in world. And then obviously we'd have to talk about Derrida and Foucault, which we can't do right now. But you are defined by language. And so, again, just very quickly, although I haven't, I haven't succeeded at being very quick at anything so far, but I'm gonna try. Starting with Lacan, you are fractured. You have no identity, but you desperately want, you, somehow you desperately want, you neurotically want an identity. And so, the only way, according to Butler, that we can form identities is by, in a certain sense, making a contrast. You have to abject, abject something. You have to throw something out. You have to make a darkness according to which you can appear by contrast as the light according to that darkness. And so Western, Western philosophy, Western thought, has begun 
by objecting the homosexual. The homosexual becomes that cast out one, according to which you can form a fixed identity. You and your fractured self can somehow put yourself together like Humpty Dumpty by casting another out. And according to Butler, that other cast out one is the homosexual. Now, she'll try to ground that in Freud's thought, uh, supplemented by Lacan. She takes the Freudian Oedipus complex and says, actually, there, there's a more primal fear in your psyche that goes deeper than the Oedipus complex. In the Oedipus complex, you want to sleep with your mother, and the boy wants to sleep with his mother and kill his father. Butler says, wait a minute. There's no reason why there should be this natural cathexis, this natural desire of the boy for the mother. As a matter of fact, there's a more fundamental sexual desire of the boy for the same sex parent. And that desire is even more terrifying and unacceptable than the cathexis for the mother, than the desire for the mother. And so that desire has to be, has to be suppressed. And so profoundly suppressed that one has, will have all through their life a melancholy for the suppressed sexual desire. And it's that suppressed desire and melancholy that actually will, for instance, form the male body of the boy into a body like unto his father's. So it is, it is suppressed homosexual desire that leads to this force that is going to ultimately form the very human body. Now, oh gosh, I really have to move on, but it's, there's much more to say about Butler. Um, I, but okay, so I, I have to say this. So this, what, so what's happened then is an, an ideal is therefore presented by the law of the heterosexual. That's the norm that you have. To, that is the ego ideal that you have to meet. And again, you are forced to perform actions to try to meet that ideal. And that actually shapes your very body. And so she'll actually say that the law is the soul of your body. She uses Aristotelian thought where your soul is what gives your body form and identity. It's what makes you exist as yourself. For Butler, your soul, so that which makes your body exist as it, as it does, is the social law, is the law of essentially of language. And that makes the male body and the female body. So your very body, and you come into existence as a subject only through that maleness and femaleness. So your very body is constructed as a result of a gendered power matrix in which you live. Now, this becomes disrupted though. Why? Because sometimes desires arrive and arise that are not in line with that, with that Aristotelian order that I, that I mentioned. Uh, she uses an example that Foucault uses of a, of a hermaphrodite named Herculine, where she'll say the pleasures that Herculine sought did not match with her body. It's like there was no subject for her, for her pleasures. Foucault says she was like the Cheshire, the grin of the Cheshire cat, except without the cat, just the grin, disembodied pleasure. Butler's only problem with that statement is that Foucault somehow thinks that the, the pleasures are pre-discursive. Butler says nothing is pre-discursive. Everything is given to you in discourse. And so what's left of you? I don't know. You are, you are defined and made by a social matrix. And for her, a heteronormative patriarchal social matrix. 
that's what defines your very body. However, that is simply an identity that's given to you. It's, it's, so your very sex bodied is simply an imitation of this image that's given to you. So sex itself, biological sex is an imitation of an imagination. And so what has to be done? This has to be disrupted. How do you disrupt it? You put up a mirror to it. How do you put up a mirror to it? With things like drag, women dressing up as men. They are mirroring, they're mirroring men. Excuse me, the men mirroring women. That itself is an image of what sex itself is. Sex itself, biological sex itself is simply a performance. It's a performance trying to live up to an image. So drag is necessary to disrupt and to, and to demystify what sex is itself. And so through things like drag and anything that disrupts the heteronormative, the heteronormative matrix, that matrix can be broken down, presumably so that different possibilities for pleasure can be freed up different expressions. Now, there's no pleasure. Bovar would say there's an underlying freedom. For Butler, there's nothing underlying. All pleasure is, is created discursively. So it's really hard to tell what's being freed. But what's clear is that she wants as little abjected as possible, as little thrown out as possible. Everything needs to be possible. And so really, definition and identity itself need to be broken down as much as possible because they are built upon abjection. They're built upon casting others out and we shouldn't cast, each, cast any others out. Okay, I trust that's sufficiently obscure. Oh my goodness, I'm already way over time. So let me just very, very briefly, I have to end with the love story. I have to end with Thomas and, and um, John Paul II. And in a way, guys, this can try to tie everything together. Hopefully you've seen so far, the fundamental question is who are we? Who are we? And what are we? Are we simply a vehicle for genes? A kind of a, a mechanism um, through which genes are projected into the future. You exist as you are as male because that was in the end, what was most adaptive for a gene to reproduce itself into the eons. Are you a freedom? Are you essentially a disembodied freedom whose, whose only goal in life is to project your freedom in the world as widely as, and as abidingly as possible? Or are you somehow a fractured, a fractured product of discourse? that is held together by, perform by performing and reiterating laws that literally hold you together with the illusion of, of being an identity, of being a stable thing that exists in time. And to what extent can you possibly free yourself from that matrix? And so perhaps so let out and permit some other possibilities to materialize. Or are you given as, in fact, an independently existing identity, as what Aristotle would call a substance? Do you have your own individual identity? I really think what's at issue here in large part is the whole question of nature and does nature exist? Is there a nature? And nature is from the root of birth. 
So the question is, what does our birth mean? How are we given? What does it mean for us to be given? A priest, Italian priest, Monsignor Luigi Giussani, was fond of saying, I am you who make me. We are most fundamentally given by another. That's what we are as a human person. We're given by another. And critical to that point, we're given as human persons, which means we're given as both body and soul, as spirit and matter, both of those two existing together. And so we can accept what the evolutionists say. All other thing about the, how did sexual differences evolve? Atomist, John Paul II, fine, absolutely. But what's the problem? Is that they miss the picture by, they reduce us to matter essentially. And so they miss the picture of who and what we are. They miss the, pack, the, they miss the picture of our destiny. Unlike Simone de Beauvoir says, we're given with meaning. We're given with destiny. And according to Thomas Aquinas, if we're going to understand sexual difference, we have to, we can only understand sexual difference according to our destiny, according to our end. How do we understand our end? Well, we can only understand our end in terms of who we are. And who are we? As I mentioned, we're both matter and spirit. And as matter and spirit, that means our, our destiny is, is bound up with spirit. And what all hold, and that, and, that, and that what John Paul II teaches, is that our destiny is bound with communion. It's bound with intimacy. It's bound in becoming one with others. In a word, it's bound with love and it's bound with marriage. For marriage is nothing other than, a, than an intimate union of love, of two persons existing together. But further, we're ordered to not only this intimacy of marriage, but we're ordered to a celestial wedding. We're ordered to the, the wedding feast of the lamb. We're ordered to a union with God to an intimate union with God. And the argument that I ultimately want to make is that sexual difference is precisely about revealing our destiny to us, our destiny in intimacy. And that destiny, that very destiny, destiny is written in our flesh. Sexual difference regards the asymmetrical division of the power of generation. Our power of generation is divided into two, not symmetrically, they're different. What does that difference reveal? It reveals an ordering of one to the other. According to John Paul II, that ordering is an ordering of gift. It's an ordering of giving and receiving in love. The masculine, the, the, the parad paradigmatic masculine is the original initiator of the gift, the giver of the gift. The, 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 the paradigmatic feminine is the original receiver of the gift, but that in receiving the gift immediately gives the gift back in return. And so the original giver immediately becomes a receiver and the original receiver immediately becomes a giver. So you have a, a giving receiver and a receiving giver. And so the male and female body are about expressing this dynamic of gift that lies at the very heart of the cosmos. It speaks to the very generativity of God. Because even for God, it's not good to be alone. God is, we Christians believe that God is not alone. God is a community of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit existing in love. And then out of love, God generates a cosmos. He initiates the gift. 
and all receive the gift. We receive the gift. And thus all of creation is paradigmatically feminine as receiving the gift from another. But then we're called to return that gift immediately back, which is our love for God. And that's the fundamental movement of all of us by what Thomas Aquinas calls the eternal law. And in that eternal law, we are called to be generative. We're called not to hoard our being, but to share our being. And interestingly, in order for us to share our being in the order of physical, of physical generation, we can't do it by ourselves. We need another. So in order, in, in a certain sense, to love God by, by giving the praise of glory to his being, by producing new being, we need to find another. But not just any other. An other with the difference of sexual difference. A man needs to find a woman. A woman needs to find a man. So that they express that otherness, that dynamic, of the giving of gift. And, and thus that gift of selves becomes marriage. That marriage which bears the fruit of new life. But more than that, it's an image of our own destiny, which is our return to the Father, our return to God, our intimacy in love with God. So how do we speak to each other about sexual difference with these different visions? All I can say is that I really think we have to begin with this question of who are we? Who are you? As I said, are you a vehicle for genes? Is that who you are? Is that who you are fundamentally? Is that who you know yourself to be? Is that who you think yourself to be? Are you a disembodied freedom? The meaning of whose life is to, is to project your freedom into the world. Is that the meaning of your existence? Is that who you are? Are you this fractured self defined by social forces and, and matrices of power? Or are you you who makes you? Are you given as, as a person destined to love and destined ultimately to marriage into intimate union with your maker? The end. Thank you, everybody. Sorry I went on so long. Um, I went as fast as I could. No. Thank you, Professor Fortin. That was that was really great. Um, in fact, yeah, it, it was a little long, but I figured, at least on my account, what you were saying was better than anything I would ask. So I just wanted to keep listening. Um, but I did want to ask something kind of related to the to the Butler story, right? So that's the most radical um, diving down into it, it, trying to peel away all of the layers. So I'll exercise the prerogative of the chair and ask the first question. That is, given what you started with, which is a lot of the science and the more contemporary science that uh, as to how early these, uh, these sexual differences emerge in, um, in our biological, in our material selves in biology, is like, let me put it really bluntly, right? The most controversial way possible. Is the Butler sort of milieu just past its sell by date, right? I mean, if, if it's true that the biological stuff starts emerging within a few weeks of, uh, of an embryo's life, then it's clearly and simply not the case that we're merely a confected product of uh, dominant discourses. Or is her theory more subtle than that and therefore deserves, I guess, more treatment? It's a great question, Dr. Stewart. And, um, you know, obviously I've, I've thought about this a lot and um, I'm, I'm really grateful, just I should give a thanks. I'm really grateful to the uh, Program for Constitutional Studies at Notre Dame University for, for 
housing me out there. So can I, I could spend a year thinking about Judith Butler. Um, I'm, maybe I shouldn't be grateful for that because <laughs> um, it almost drove me insane. Um, but I think what she would say is that and here, here's the Trump card. And it's like, it's like the Kantian, it's, it's like a different version of the Kantian Trump card. You can never get at noumenal reality, right? For Kant, the distinction between the phenomenal and the noumenal. The noumenal might exist. So, so I'm sorry, maybe everybody doesn't know Kant's language. Right? You, have, you have things as they are in themselves. And fine, they exist as they are in themselves. But what's the problem? I can never get at them as they are in themselves because everything I know is filtered through, for Kant, through transcendental categories, both of experience and of reason. And so everything that I know is filtered through, through these, um, for Kant, transcendental categories. So I can never know the thing as it is in itself. But for Kant, at least the categories are transcendental. They hold across all rational individuals. They're true for all rational individuals, right? So all rational individuals will experience things in time and space. All rational individuals will experience causality, not because causality is real in the world, in the noumenal world, but because the categories, uh, in this case of reason, organize my experience that way. So what Butler will say, first of all, there's, I mean, Kant, no way we can talk about any sort of transcendental categories. That's insane for Butler. All of the categories are, con are contingent. But nevertheless, every single thing you know is known through a social lens. The language that you're trying to speak about sex with is a language that's given to you through a social lens with social meaning, meaning in a way, as Heidegger would say, always already embedded in a world of meaning and therefore colored with that meaning. And nothing can escape that meaning. So anything you talk about is always already colored with that meaning, with the meaning that your world gives you. And that's why science itself comes under attack. Why? Because science itself is a product of this world. And it's a world created by a heteronormative patriarchal matrix. Everything is created by this matrix. And therefore, science itself is simply a tool of that matrix. And as, as Beauvoir talked about mystification, the, these matrices create, they create the world in, a, in such a way as to hide their activity. It kind of reminds me of young earthers, right? When you say to a young earther, you know, the, the, the earth isn't 6,000 years old. Look at, this, look at this fossil evidence that seems to go back billions of years. What do they say? Well, no, it was created to look like it goes back six or four billion years. Well, similarly, the matrix creates science to give science the look of objectivity. And so, so everything is interpreted through this meaning. So that is, that is essentially how she would respond, I think, Dr. Stewart. You just Great. can't escape the matrix. Yeah, thank you. We've got sure. some questions piling up here, so I wanna dive in. Is there a risk of overemphasizing sexual difference to the point of losing the relation between the sexes? Sub question, did you encounter any evolutionary theorists who emphasize the inclusive fitness of the sexes working together as a single species in complementary ways. Do gender theorists admit at a minimum that opposites attract even if they see otherness in a fluid way? Wow. Um, okay, let me, I, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna have to open the chat um, to, to, to read that again. Yeah. Let me start, let me start with what I think I hope is gonna be the easier one. 
I'm going to pick the low hanging fruit first, um, which is the evolutionist um, as far as kind of seeing um, a symbiotic, sometimes a symbiotic relationship between the sexes. And I have to just say absolutely yes. And I think sometimes marvelously yes. Um, as a matter of fact, I think it's so cool some of the things that they say. Um, you know, as, as Dr. Stewart indicated, my doctoral dissertation was on fatherhood. So I had to look a lot about the evolution. What did the evolutionists say about the evolution of fatherhood? Because, um, you know, it's funny, some, some evolutionists will say that the contemporary question is, why don't males provide an equal contribution to child rearing, um, as do females? And interestingly, uh, the, the, um, the evolutionist says, look, for us, the question is more, why do human males contribute anything at all? <laughs> because most primates are simply sperm donors. They just donate the sperm and then they go do their own thing. So why do human males contribute anything at all? This gets incredibly fascinating. So what they've discovered is that I think it's about 2 million years ago, maybe 2.5 million years ago, um, we started eating meat. And we started, we started being able to kill animals. Uh, well, we started uh, flint napping and making stone tools. And with those stone tools, we could do things like, like kill the wildebeest. And when we could kill the wildebeest, all of a sudden we had this new store of super high nutrient rich food. Well, it turns out that offspring that had access to that food developed better. And so if a female could, could in some way entice a male to commit to helping rear the offspring, those offspring would be um, ev evolutionarily advantaged. They would, be, they would be more adaptive. And so pair bonding started to evolve. It started to become adaptive that males would contribute to rearing the offspring. Now, the evolutionists note that it's at that point that, that this rapid development in the brain happens to the point that, that uh, even according to a materialist, that allows for the human being to come into existence. So in other words, it's paternal, it's paternal investment in the pair bonding of marriage that, that allows for the very development of the human brain. According, in a certain sense, to the, to the, fossil, the fossil evidence. I said marriage. I spoke, too, I, I spoke too far there, but pair bonding. But we could talk about the evolution of marriage then um, because males and females have different needs. Um, the male has a need to know that this offspring that he's gonna invest in is his offspring. The female has a different need. The female needs to know that the male's not gonna run out on her because her, her offspring are gonna be so much more advantaged with the male there. Marriage solves both of those problems. Marriage allows the male to know because you make a unique pair bond. Now the male will know that this offspring is mine, not the milkman's. The, the commitment will allow the female to know that he's not gonna run off. If I give him access to my fertility, he's not gonna run off. So marriage allows each of them evolutionarily to have what they most need in order for the offspring to flourish, which is gonna increase their genetic, um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the survival of their, of their children. And that's borne out even still in hunter-gatherer societies now. Um, so, oh my goodness, I so forgot the first two parts of the question. That's but okay. maybe, maybe Thomas, just since there's so many questions, I, I know Thomas, I'll, I can answer the other ones personally sometimes. 
So okay. why don't we go on to the second question? Yeah, well, let me, yeah, let me get um, one of the students in. Uh, so Hannah says, in much of the church, women are still viewed as primarily receptive and men are often termed as active, although no one will say either sex is 100% one or the other. How does this circumvent Beauvoir's criticism, which states that men lead the active life in the world, expressing their freedom, whereas women are relegated to the home by a sort of biological determinism. What does a healthy relationship to the givenness of one's body look like? And she says, I believe it goes without saying that the public sphere needs the feminine genius. Wow, these are such good questions. Um, and, and not easy, not easy to answer. Um, so let me, let me give it a try, probably saying that, um, uh, that I really do think that, that my, my complete answer would be John Paul II's Theology of the Body. Um, but le let me take a stab at it um, because it's, it's really, I think it's really poignant. And, and let me just say, when, when I was expressing Butler I was, or, or Beauvoir, I was really trying to put across that she has some totally valid points. And I totally grant that. So what I like about John Paul II is he goes back to how were things in the beginning? You know, it, it goes back to Christ. In the beginning, it was not so. You know, they said Moses allowed us to, to write a writ of divorce. What do you say? Jesus says, in the beginning, it was not so. So JP2 tries to take us back to the beginning with the idea of, of a kind of right rapport between the sexes, which will be one not tainted by original sin, by our selfishness that tends to lead towards things like oppression. So, you know, the, the oppression that that Beauvoir is speaking of is absolutely, in some cases, real. So then your question, is it the fact that her very body, though, is an instance of oppression, as Beauvoir seems to hold? Is motherhood itself, when, when Beauvoir is talking about motherhood, she's like, maybe if a woman wants to be a mother, she could be a mother, but it's really hard to pull off without, without truncating your freedom. For what it's worth, Sartre is the exact same way about fatherhood. And both of them expressly made sure that they were not mothers or fathers physically. So how in the world do we reconcile this freedom? And especially, and I'll admit, I, I, I hesitated to bring up the whole receptivity thing because that's just like a lightning rod. Oh, you're saying that women are passive. Women have to be passive barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen. That's, so just for what it's worth, that's not at all what I'm saying, at all. So what is this meaning uh, of, of the sexed bodies? First point is, and this is something, I'm glad you asked this question because it allows me to kind of ex extrapolate a little bit. Um, something that the Thomistic um, Thomistic understanding of substance allows us to get at is something that Butler, that simply can't get at. Butler holds that we come into existence through these identities of male and female. That's how you come into existence as a substance. So your maleness and femaleness is more primary than your existence as a substance itself. Whereas in JP2's understanding, in Thomas Aquinas' understanding, I am first and foremost a human being, a human person. That is my essence. My essence is to be a human person. Now, it turns out that human persons are, as it were, modulated into two, two kinds, two modes. The distinction is modal. One can be human as a male, one can be human as a female. And those distinctions do not touch the essence. 
That means we are absolutely equal in dignity, absolutely equal in destiny. So what's, what, what is the nature of the difference then? Well, obviously, there are different roles in reproduction. That's just the biology of the fact. One begets, the other gives birth. One will end up, um, and there's that great, that great scene in Monty Python's uh, Life of Brian, where, where um, Stan wants to become a woman, Stan wants to become Loretta. And, and uh, I forget the name of the guy, but he said, but you haven't got a womb. You know, where are you gonna gestate the baby? Um, obviously there are things that a woman can do that a man can't. And those things are, are simply, those things are simply facts. Now, is there a meaning to them? I tried to note, like, what is the meaning? And this is where, for me, when I'm talking about receptivity, we're talking about a symbolic order. JP2 holds it, and I think he's right. Our bodies are in a way sacramental. That is, they're a sign of something. They're teaching us something. And they're showing us, they're showing us in the body this order that exists in the giving of gift. And in the giving of gift, there is simply an order. And in that order, one, one in the order has to be the initiator of the gift. And so one, one flows out as it were to the other. And as I said, that, that other, must first then receive the gift. And JP2 will talk about active receptivity. That receptivity is active, which it, so, it's so fascinating. The egg, the very egg shows this, this active receptivity. As a sperm is trying to get to the, to the nucleus of the egg, a, a bunch of sperms, if you see an egg with sperms around a man, there's like thousands of sperm that are trying to get into that into that nucleus. One makes its way to the nucleus. It gets to the nucleus. Then what happens? The active receptivity stops. Bam! The egg locks down. And other eggs that may have, other sperm that may have penetrated the egg are locked in place. They can't go any further. Why? Because the egg itself is actively receptive. Now, that active receptivity, as I said, immediately translates into giving. And now the giver becomes receiver. So the difference is simply one of priority. And what is that, but what is that showing? What is that trying to show us? To my mind, it is a sacramental, it is a symbol. Our bodies symbolize our relationship to, to our maker. That is, we have been given. Being is a gift. And being us then as being must return ourselves to the gift. And so how do we have to live? We have to live this dynamic of giving and receiving in love. Two, in this case, with equal, dig equal dignity, the difference being what our bodies symbolize and what they try to show and what they try to show is this, is this relationship that we believe, as Christians believe, exists in the heart of the Trinity as a communion of love, where each are equal, none is oppressed. But rather, it's another point that, oh gosh, um, where in the union of two others, in true intimacy, when two are united, each becomes more what they are. And I guess with, with seeing how many questions remain, I'll have to leave it at that. And I'm so sorry, it's insufficient. But again, the answer is the full theology of the body. But thank you so much for the question. How can the gift of self be balanced against the personal need for interpersonal communion? That is, does the desire for marriage properly proceed first from the love of another or from the recognition of one's own good and vocation? I'm just, I'm, I, I'm genuinely amazed at the quality of these questions. These are beautiful questions. 
Um, and they're not easy. <laughs> um, and so, um, and so I, I mean, let me just say that I'm gonna give these, I mean, I wish we could just have a discussion because wisdom, this is how wisdom comes in, in discussion. So I'll just offer you what um, my, my first, just my first thoughts. Um, and quite frankly, they're kind of conflicted. Um, because one thing that comes to mind is um, something again that Luigi Giussani says, and he, he asked you to do this little experiment. And he says, imagine that you were born today, but instead of being an infant, you're born with the maturity that you have now, you're born basically as an adult. He says, what would your first response be? And he claims that your first response would be wonder, would be amazement, just amazement at the beauty of that which is. And it's so interesting because the other answer that sometimes comes is fear. But Yusani anticipates that question. And he basically says, you can't, you're not going to have fear unless you've implicitly had the wonder and amazement, because if you have nothing to lose, you're not afraid. If you have absolutely nothing that you value, you won't be afraid. So if you haven't recognized the goodness of the other, and, 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 and goodness itself, then you won't respond with fear. And so there's, some, there's a way in which it seems to me that we always need the other. We always need the other in a way to reveal ourselves to ourselves. You know, it's not clear that by ourselves to what extent we could even know ourselves. Lacan would actually like this, but, but, but all that being said, It just seems to me, and this is also from what limited clinical experience I have, that this is almost implicit in the golden rule, right? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Somehow this notion of loving yourself and preserving your own being, even even when Thomas Aquinas is talking about the natural law. So just really quickly, you know, that for Thomas, the natural law is our participation in the eternal law, which is how God orders all things to himself. So there's a grand movement in the cosmos through which everything, all being, according to Thomas, loves God. And is ordered towards God, is ordered towards the praise of God and the praise of the goodness of being because it's good, existence is good. God created, take each day. And what does he say at the end of each day? It is good, it's good. So existence is good. And the natural law, the way that we're governed is based upon this recognition of the goodness of being. And according to Thomas, you have to recognize the goodness of your own being. You have to start with seeing that you are good. And for him, this is gonna be intimately tied then towards your recognition of God, right? Why are you gonna praise God? Why are you gonna thank God if your own existence isn't good? So without this fundamental recognition of the goodness of your own existence, you're, it's like you're taking yourself out of this current that leads to God. So what happens next then, part of that expression of the goodness of your own being, the recognition of the goodness of your own being is, I should share my being. 
My being is good. I want to share it. I want to generate another. Well, how do I generate another? I can't generate another by myself. By myself, I can't be generated. I need another to share myself, to, 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 to share the goodness that God has given me. How do I do that then? Wow, I need to find this other. Who is this other? This other is my spouse. This other precisely with whom I can be generative. And so if I'm a man, I need to find a woman. If I'm a woman, I need to find a man because that is how this very power that expresses the, the goodness of existence itself is expressed, which is in itself a part of this, this movement of all things to God. So yes, in a way, it starts with the recognition of your own goodness, which is implicitly a recognition of the goodness of God and a gratitude towards God. And then in that gratitude, one then goes out and looks for one's spouse. And so then the whole thing, and, to the, and so to the prior question, how does, the, how does the dynamic work between man and woman then? It has to work in the context of gratitude for one's existence and therefore gratitude for, the, for your spouse's existence, which will flower in the existence of another, namely the child and the growth of your own existence, the enrichment of your own existence, the amplification of being, which ends up in the eternal wedding feast with the lamb as you together go towards your heavenly destiny which is your union with God. So that's the love story. That's the romance. Great. That is, that is a really good way to, uh, to end the evening. I have to say that I rarely has there been uh, a session like this where more sort of hefty meaty things were put on the table in such a short time and where we felt like we could go another hour or more. But I am getting a text message from my wife that says our small, our small child requires daddy snuggles in order to go to sleep. So um, I at least will have to uh, will have to conclude there. But thank you all for uh, for your time tonight, and thank you especially for, uh, to Professor Fortin um, for all the all the work and thought that you put into this and the wisdom that you have brought to us. Mm -hmm.